In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. I would like to speak for uh, a short while about the value of my life in Christ. And if you would like to ask any questions or make any comment, and please use the chat uh, area provided with this broadcast, and we will consider your questions uh, at the end of the presentation. We live in an uncomfortable age. Though most of us in the West have more possessions and technology and a better standard of education and health care than at any other time in the history of the world, there is a pandemic of anxiety, stress, low self-esteem, loneliness and every dark thought. We have one of the healthiest and wealthiest of societies, but it is also one of the most miserable and distressed. There are more than 8 million cases of anxiety in the UK each year, and certainly even more in this unusual period of pandemic under coronavirus. Almost 7% of the UK population will experience anxiety every week. In the last year, in another survey, 75% of respondents had felt overwhelmed by stress in the past year. The same sort of statistics hold for most Western countries. We have more than our ancestors could possibly have imagined, but it has not made us happier. Indeed, it has made us more distressed in every way. This distress changes the way we act. 46% in one survey reported that they ate too much or ate unhealthily due to stress. 29% reported that they started drinking or increased their drinking, and 16% reported that they started smoking or increased their smoking. There are psychological effects as well. 51% of adults who felt stressed reported feeling depressed, and 61% reported feeling anxious. Of the people who said they have felt stress at some point in their lives, 16% had self-harmed and 32% said they had had suicidal thoughts and feelings. Over 37% of adults who reported feeling stressed also reported feeling lonely as a result. We live in a society which both demands that we feel happy and satisfied, and yet makes us ill and prevents us finding fulfillment. Scientific studies have shown that using social media too much and in the wrong way makes us unhappy and distressed. We find that it encourages us to constantly compare ourselves with others in a negative way. And it can make us afraid that we are missing out on the experiences and success. Hundreds and thousands of friends or followers we can end up feeling more miserable, more isolated, more valueless and dissatisfied than before. When we start to feel like this, even when outwardly it seems that we have everything we could want or need, then the experience makes us feel even worse. We can have a downward spiral that seems without any reasonable cause. But the Orthodox Christian spiritual tradition has something to say about this condition, about this distress, which all of us feel at one time or another, but which seems to overwhelm some of us. It is in the first place not a condition. It is in the first place not a condition that is sent by God, as if he chooses to punish us. If we think that our distress is sent by God, then this only adds to our sense of being worthless and broken, dissatisfied and unfulfilled. God will often allow us to experience distress because this helps us to discover our need and leads us to begin the journey into union with him. We often try to cover our real inner condition through possessions, wealth, popularity and pleasure. When God allows us to feel an emptiness, a sense of detachment and isolation, this is never a punishment. In the second place, it is a condition which belongs to the human nature apart from God. It is not what God intends for us, but it is what it is like to be a human outside 
of the close union with God which he created us to enjoy. It can be increased by our own wrong actions and wrong thinking. But to a great extent, when we have negative feelings and feelings of worthlessness, these are caused by our own distance from God and by the words and actions of others who are also distant from God. But in the third place, God himself has entered the world to deal with the consequences of the fall of Adam and Eve turning away from God. He has made a way for each of us to become more completely the human person he us to be. So it is possible for us to discover a meaning and a purpose and satisfaction and value to our lives. Feel suicidal or have suicidal thoughts. Sometimes it is necessary that we have a medical intervention to help us find some sense of stability to start a journey of healing. But for those who are struggling, but more or less coping, not feeling happy, experiencing distress, but not to the point of thinking of harming ourselves, there is the possibility of an increasing experience of healing according to God's will and in discovering the value and purpose of our lives. How do we find meaning, purpose and value for ourselves and our lives and the increasing experience of healing? so that we are no longer subject to distress of various kinds. The orthodox spiritual tradition insists that it is through an increasing union with God by the indwelling Holy Spirit and by the renewal of our mind, truly, more as they really are. Part of our sickness, the cause of our distress, is not seeing things as they really are. One of my favorite passages in the scripture is when the king of Syria surrounded the city of Dothan, where Elisha the prophet was staying. We read in 2 Kings chapter 6 verses 15 to 17. When the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was filled with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Part of our healing and the spiritual therapy required to deal with our distress and our sense of having a life without value is that we are able to see things as they really are. Just as the servant of Elisha needed the divine activity to be able to see what was already present, already the reality, but which he could not see and so was filled with fear. Two different aspects of our healing must come together. On the one hand, we certainly and absolutely need the grace and the life of God in the Holy Spirit. We become what God intends for us only in union with God. We become truly alive and authentically human only in union with God by the indwelling Holy Spirit. But on the other hand, we also have to do a necessary work within ourselves so that we break free from wrong and negative thoughts and wrong and negative behaviours that lead to distressing and overwhelming feelings. What does God intend and wish for us all? The Orthodox Christian faith believes and has taught from the beginning that the meaning and value of our life and our being cannot be separated from God's purpose in uniquely calling us into existence. My own meaning and value must be found in the meaning and value which God gives me in creating me. This is a wonderful truth. It means that I do not have to create or earn a meaning and value myself. I already exist uniquely as a person with a meaning and a value that belongs to no one else. St. Athanasius tells us, God is good or rather is essentially the source of all goodness. 
Now, one that is good cannot be mean and miserly about anything. Therefore, begrudging existence to none, he has made all things out of nothing by his word, Jesus Christ our Lord. It is in the eternal and infinite goodness of God who does not just do good things from time to time, but is goodness itself. It is in this unfathomable goodness that God has created each of us, that he created me, that he created you. Therefore, the meaning and purpose and value of our own life is found, first of all, in the goodness of God. I am valuable because God has called me into existence. I have a meaning and purpose because there is a meaning and purpose in all that God creates. My life has value because it is the working out of what God has created me to be in his goodness. But it is not only that I have value and you have value. That might make us feel comforted, believing that God loves us and has made us in his goodness. But our life has value and meaning and purpose. And this leads us to activity, to transformation and to an increasing union with God as the goal of the human life. Indeed, the goal of our own lives. What is the value of you? We can believe that at the beginning, God made all things in his goodness and so that he might share his life and his love with us. But when we consider our own brokenness and weakness, it is easy for us to imagine that we no longer have such a value to God because we have stained the life which God gave to Adam and Eve in the beginning. And in our own lives, we struggle each day with sin and doubt, anxiety and fear and every dark feeling. This is an easy attitude to take. It makes sense to say that whatever value we had when God created us has all been lost because of our own actions and the circumstances of our lives. Nevertheless, when we hear the words of truth from the one who is the way, the truth and the life, we discover that he reveals the reality of things to us from God's own perspective. We read in the Gospels, in John chapter 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is how much God loved the world when it was broken and had turned away from him. He loved the world so much that he gave his own son, the word of the father and God himself for our salvation and to bring us back into union with him. And if we doubt it, then we can find it expressed again in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While I was a sinner, Christ died for me. This is how valuable I am to him. While you were a sinner, Christ died for you. This is how valuable you are to him, precious as being his own creation and then infinitely precious as being worth the value. This is what God says of us. This is what God shows us is our true worth. We, you and I, each of us is a wonderful and unique creation of God, completely irreplaceable. And he shows us how precious we are to him by entering into his own creation and suffering even death for each one of us. Why are we precious to God? It is not only because of his creation of each one of us, but because of what he has created us for. He has created us to become. And so the whole of our life becomes precious and filled with value. It has been gifted to us so that we might fulfill the purpose of God in becoming, becoming the person he has created us to be. Much of the distress in our life is caused by our failure to understand and embrace this purpose so that we are not yet becoming who we have been created to be. There is always a sense of uneasiness and of not being satisfied and of never quite knowing who we are and what we are for. 
Everything is unsettled in one way or another, in anxiety and in stress, in loneliness and isolation, even in despair and abandonment to empty pleasures. We are not made to live without God. As a bird needs the air and a fish needs the sea, we need to be growing into union with God and our life or the wrong goal. Then we cannot avoid being distressed. We will be uncomfortable with life in various ways. If we have made seeking after God, stretching always and with all our energy towards a deeper experience of God, then we will find that our efforts match the purpose for which we were created and called into existence. And we will become that person we were intended to be, discovering peace, patience, joy, hope, courage and faith. Our value cannot be separated from our life. How I live is intended to be the means of me experiencing how much I am valued by God. Without movement and development and growth, we are not properly alive because we cannot fulfill our purpose, and value or meaning. Waking up and knowing that nothing we might say or do was of any consequence is a soul-crushing experience. Yet for the Orthodox Christian, more than anyone else, there should be purpose, meaning and value in each moment. When we live without a clear knowledge of or commitment to that purpose, then our life is lived without direction or meaning. We might fill it with all manner of activity and we may create a purpose for ourselves but if it is not the purpose revealed by the living creator God who made us and renewed us in his word by the indwelling Holy Spirit, then it is of no purpose at all. It is possible that we can create a purpose for ourselves that is practically no different to that of the non-Christian people around us. We can make becoming wealthy our purpose, even if we also give some space to being religious and even spiritual. We can make becoming highly educated our purpose and seek to gain as many qualifications as possible. We can make becoming important and gaining prestige among others our purpose in our employment or even in the church. We can make being happy, self-fulfilled, self-satisfied our purpose. And we can spend all of our time finding ways to enjoy life as far as we understand it. None of these are any different to the purposes that non-Christians adopt for themselves. And none of them are a worthy purpose for the one who has been united with Christ by the indwelling Holy Spirit. But we can deceive ourselves and convince ourselves that these are God's purpose for us and that some experience of the spiritual life and some commitment to religious behavior, even religious service, is enough to fulfill our obligations to God so that we can create a purpose which satisfies ourselves. When something fulfills its purpose, then it is doing and being exactly what it was made for. If we use a lawnmower on a carpet, then it will not be fulfilling its purpose. If we try to use a car underwater, it will not be fulfilling its purpose. Something inappropriate, then they will fail in the end and may even cause harm. This is why so many of the devices we can purchase have instructions about what they should not be used for as much as what they should be used for. We should not imagine that our human life is any different. Just as a car must be used as a car to fulfill its purpose, so each human is called to live according to a certain purpose that manifests our human nature authentically. And any other purpose must lead us to becoming less completely human, as God intended. For the Orthodox Christian, this purpose should be the basis of our life, our ambitions and every activity. It is not enough to engage in some religious and spiritual behavior while living according to our own purpose. That cannot make us truly human and it is not properly Christian. Indeed, it is not Christian at all. If we are not living out the purpose of the Christian life, 
the authentically human life, then we are not really Christian and not really human. This is why so many of us live in anxiety, fear, loneliness, compulsion, anger, frustration, boredom and emptiness. We are not living as God intended. We are not living out the purpose of God for human life. We are not authentically human. What does God say? He has not failed to communicate his purpose for us. In Exodus 9.16, God gives Moses a message to speak before the Pharaoh. And he says, For this purpose I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. God is here speaking to a man, a violent ruler who has enslaved the Israelites and is not a believer in the true God at all. But this man has a purpose in God's will because all of mankind has just such a purpose. It is not exclusively for those who are Orthodox Christians as if others can choose some other purpose. Rather, it is the universal purpose of all human life. And all of mankind must embrace this purpose in order to become authentically human. What does God say that the purpose he has for Pharaoh is? It is threefold. In the first place, we see that our circumstances belong to God and not to ourselves. I have raised you up. We cannot say, look at what I have achieved. I will give God this little worship and attention, but all of this belongs to me. On the contrary, all that we have already belongs to God. In the parable, the Lord Jesus warns us of the man who lives for himself. The fool says to himself, soul, you have laid up many goods for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. The foolish man thought that all he had was due to himself. He thought that having worked hard, he could take credit for his own success. But in fact, in one night, the one who is truly Lord and master of all calls him to account. And he is found to be desperately poor, since he can take none of his wealth with him. And his self-importance in this life is of no consequence before God. When we really believe that all that we have is of God and that we belong to God and that we find our purpose in this belonging to God, then and only then is there lasting meaning value in our life. God gives us all that we in turn give to him. When we think that we own ourselves, then we are withholding what properly belongs to God. And relying on our own resources, we can create nothing with any eternal value. When we give ourselves entirely to God, he gives us silver and gold to build our lives with. When we think that we are the masters of our own destiny, then we discover that we have built with hay and straw, burnt up in the furnace of the divine presence. In the second place, the purpose God has is that he may show my power in you. The purpose of God, even for the unbelieving, is that he may come to have a relationship with each one so that his power might be manifest in each life. This power is the Holy Spirit. Power of the highest will overshadow you. Our relationship with God is not an external one. We do not recognize God as the distant and remote deity we must obey, since he gives us life and all things. On the contrary, we discover that together with all of our daily life and all things, and more importantly, himself, he gives what we need and is found dwelling within our hearts as the power of God, the Holy Spirit who brings Christ to life in us. The purpose of God for each of us is that we live in the light of the loving gift of all things from God's hands and the ownership of God, which brings us to life. 
but also with the unceasing experience of union with God by the indwelling power and energy of God in the Holy Spirit. There is no value in our life. We are not truly experiencing human life at all when we do not live out of the power of God by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Therefore, we must make this our aim, since this is our purpose, that we be filled more and more with the divine power, the life and love of God, and at every moment we must choose that which will help us to grow closer to this power. Nothing else matters, nothing at all. And in the third place, this divine purpose, worked out by the power of God in us, is so that my name may be declared in all the earth. It seems to me that this points to our purpose in the world. Now, often we can jump to this third step and be very active, but in our own strength and building with hay and straw, even while we are engaged in religious, even spiritual service. This is a grave mistake. It represents the same attitude of the foolish man, but in a slightly different context. It allows us to say, look at this ministry I have created, or this service I have built. Yet this would not lead us into God's purpose for us. We cannot do things and then give them to God, asking for his blessing. We have to begin with the first step, believing and confessing that we belong entirely to God and that everything we have is of God, and therefore that all that we do is in obedience to God and not according to our own will. It is better to wait patiently to discover God's will for us, and then in obedience and in the divine power which God gives to act according to God's purpose, than for us to leap into action ourselves and in our own strength and according to our own will and then to offer this self-will, however well-intentioned we might think it, to God as if he must bless it. But this last phrase does show us how our lives are to be oriented. We are to give our whole lives day by day to God, who is the giver of all that we have and the Lord and master of every moment. We are to seek always to be filled with the divine power and energy of the indwelling Holy Spirit so that nothing we do causes us to lose this power that does not belong to us, but overwhelms and sustains us. And finally, we are to be living out these two aspects in obedient service in the world, as God wills and gives grace, so that in all things it is God who is glorified, and not us at all. How is God manifested in my life? That is what matters and what makes us truly human and gives purpose to our lives. We are to be the presence of God in the world. Not as if he was absent and we were representing him instead of him, but truly present in us and through us and with us. He gives himself to us as we give ourselves wholeheartedly to him. And in his gift, the power of God in the indwelling Holy Spirit. God is present in his world. Nothing else matters. Nothing else can make us authentically human. This is our purpose. This is what gives meaning and value to our lives in Christ. Now, we might believe that God has created us uniquely, and even that we have a purpose for our life of increasing union with God by the indwelling Holy Spirit. But what if we cannot shake the difficult feelings that plague us? Our feelings are produced by our thoughts and our feelings produce behaviours, but our thoughts do not always or often express what we ourselves, the real person we are, is thinking. Often they are attitudes, suggestions, opinions, memories that pop into our head. And we can and should choose what we do with them. St. James speaks of this when he says in James 1, 14 and 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. 
and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. This is a useful passage. It presents us with a model in which there is, first of all, a temptation which addresses our desire, which is enticed. And to entice means to stir up or set on fire. Then the desire enters into a relationship with the temptation so that sin is already present. And finally, that sin expresses itself and leads to spiritual death. We can classify these distinctions in a way that helps and say that there are thoughts which work on the various energies within us. And these thoughts can be a temptation and they are not necessarily true. Just because something appears in my head does not mean it is true. If they are harmful or negative thoughts, then they might be prompted by habits of thoughts I have already established over many months and years. They may be prompted by past experiences, especially difficult ones. They may be things I assume are true, but which are not. Or they may be due to the influence of hostile spiritual forces. These thoughts can become ingrained in us. We might always be thinking negative or harmful or untrue thoughts whenever we find ourselves in a particular situation. Just as the servant of Elisha had thoughts of despair when he saw the army circling around because he did not see things as they really were. It is these thoughts and memories and suggestions when we allow them into our heart and when we enter into a relationship with them which produce negative feelings. These feelings seem to just arise in us, but they are caused by these thoughts when we accept them and embrace them. We have allowed the thought to generate the feeling. In ordinary human terms, if I think I am a bad driver, perhaps because I have had an accident in the past, or because I am always being told that I am a bad driver by someone who is close to me, then every time I get into my car, this thought will come to me. You are a bad driver. I might not even notice it as a thought anymore. It is what I think of myself all the time. But that thought, once I have accepted it, will make me feel anxious and stressed every time I get behind the wheel. I won't be able to help it because my thoughts are telling me that I am a bad driver. And these are the feelings that go with being a bad driver. But once I have those feelings of anxiety and stress, it is very likely that I will become a bad driver. I will make mistakes and misjudgments. And I will be hypercritical of my performance so that my behavior will reinforce my thoughts. I knew I was a bad driver. And now I have proved it to myself all over again. This negative cycle can be experienced by many of us in a wide variety of situations, producing anxiety, stress, depression, loneliness and boredom. We should not be surprised that it can affect those of us who are Orthodox Christians so that we are unable to progress on the journey of our lifetime into union with God and discovering the purpose and fulfillment in this journey. What can stand in the way? What are the thoughts that overwhelm us with negative and harmful feelings? They can be thoughts about ourselves, about others, about the way the world is and about God. If we think especially about our thoughts about God, these can be based on wrong ideas and understandings. And these can produce negative feelings that stand in the way of our relationship with God and so leave us distressed and unsettled in life. We can have the thought that God is angry with us and waits only to punish us. Such a thought produces harmful feelings. We can have the thought that we must earn our way into God's favour and that religious activities have to be performed to gain points so that when we die we might get into heaven. Such a thought produces harmful feelings. We might have the thought that difficult experiences in the past have been sent to us by God or allowed because he does not care. Such a thought produces harmful feelings. Wrong thoughts produce negative feelings. 
If we allow thoughts like these to settle into our heart and mind, it is not surprising that they produce negative behaviours. So we find it almost impossible to pray with any warmth. We find it hard to read the Bible with interest and attention. Even our attendance at church services becomes a matter of fear that God will punish us or a religious habit that we perform with no fruitfulness. How can we begin the journey into union with God if we have such thoughts which produce such feelings and behaviours? We have to change our thinking and our behaviour because we cannot easily change our feelings. We have to believe the words of God rather than the disturbing thoughts which intrude upon us. And we have to commit ourselves with energy and effort to seeking after union with God by the indwelling Holy Spirit so that we become and keep on becoming the person God has created us to be, truly alive in the love of God. What does God say of us? The Bible is filled with statements of his compassion and mercy towards us, which we must read over and over again and apply to ourselves. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you to myself. He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. He says, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He says, for this purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This coming to Christ is the purpose of our life. It describes the continuing journey into union with God. To choose the spirituality of the Orthodox Church is to choose life, authentic human life. It is the means of working out our salvation and healing day by day. The purpose of every human life is only fulfilled and satisfied in coming closer to God by the indwelling Holy Spirit. We learn to pray, we fast, we read the Bible, we participate in the liturgy and services with attention because this is how we grow closer to God. We are not trying to please God. We are not trying to earn our way to heaven. We are not trying to avoid punishment. We are trying to come alive, to find peace, to find the satisfaction of every longing in Christ first and foremost before all other desires. We need to think right. This is the meaning of metanoia, of repentance. And this means replacing wrong ideas of God and ourselves with right ones. It means changing wrong ideas about what our life is for with right ones. A hard journey lies ahead of us when we choose life with God. It will occupy every moment but it begins already to bear fruit if we persevere, seeking God every day and in every way. He promises to give us the strength we need. But beyond all else, we must choose God and choose union with God as the purpose of life that gives the only lasting meaning and value to our life. This life lived in this way has an infinite value. Because in our unique relationship with God, we become the person he created us to be. That person no one else could ever be. Without God and without union with God becoming the purpose of our life, every one of us will suffer distress in one way or another. Due to our failure to become who we are and our failure to be and become truly alive. But God calls us to an unceasing journey into the experience of God, which begins now and will never end, which fulfills and satisfies while always filling us with the desire for more of God. The life with God produces peace and joy, love and patience, hope and faith, perseverance and every other blessing. 
so that our distress is healed by the divine presence and work within us of the Holy Spirit. There is always a struggle in life, but when we live it for God and with God and seeking an increasing union with God, we discover grace and strength to overcome, to persevere and to find God already who gives meaning and purpose to our life. The one who created us for union with him will work out this union in our lives if we make it our own goal as it is his own desire for us. It will give us unfailing value in our lives in every circumstance and in the face of every obstacle. May this be our experience and our desire in an increasing measure and with an increasing experience of God who gives healing in our brokenness and peace and joy in difficult times. To choose union with God is to already begin to experience it and find fruitfulness in it so that union with God is both the means and the meaning of our salvation. May this be our experience. May this be your experience to the glory of God who is compassionate and merciful towards us and draws each one of us into that closer union with him, which is the true and abundant life of God for us. Amen. Thank you. I hope that uh, a little bit of that was helpful to a few of you. I'm just looking through some of the comments. Uh, okay, I'll answer a few quickly ones. I'm str uh, why did I become Coptic instead of Eastern Orthodox? Um, God opened the way for me to become part of the Coptic Orthodox Church, uh, and I became a member of the Coptic Orthodox Church uh, in 1994, 26 years ago. Uh, and from time to time in different situations in my life I have had occasion to consider again where I belong <coughs> pardon me uh, and I feel entirely at home in this particular community um, there is a a, uh, a vibrancy about our church despite all of the problems that that most of us are well of are well aware of there is a vibrancy about it uh, there is a youthfulness and energy about our church um, it is built on the foundation of uh, the apostolic faith uh, and the spirituality of the Desert Fathers. And uh, when I consider Eastern Orthodoxy, there are uh, some aspects which uh, might appear to be more attractive. But to be honest, I, I value the humility of our church, the ordinariness of our church, uh, I love the fact that when we gather together, it is as if we are a family gathered together uh, and we offer God all that we have in our weakness. If our singing is poor, that is the singing we offer God uh, as this particular family in this place. Uh, I'm from an evangelical Protestant background and uh, there are many aspects of uh, our Coptic Orthodox life. Uh, which remind me of that family nature of the community in which I grew up. Uh, even the fact that older men and women are called uh, uncle and aunt is something that I grew up with myself. Uh, essentially, though, I became Coptic Orthodox because that is how God made his way uh, open for me. Uh, and uh, God willing, I will die within this community and in service in this community. Uh, and I have uh, absolutely no regrets and no desire to be anywhere else. Uh, a second question, let's look. <clears throat> How do we seek God? We seek God by beginning with those things which will lead us to God. Um, we believe that when we pray, when we turn our heart, not just our mouth, when we turn our heart towards God and, and pour out the contents of our heart towards God, we believe that he hears us and responds. Uh, and perhaps our prayer is very weak as we begin, and perhaps it is filled with, with doubt and confusion. Um, but if we can find within us that desire to find God if he is there, 
then God delights in our honesty uh, so that we can be like the centurion who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Uh, I, I'm being as faithful as I can. Um, or we can be like blind Bartimaeus who had no idea what was happening around him. Uh, but when he heard that Jesus might be present, uh, he cried out unceasingly uh, in that simple prayer, uh, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So we begin by prayer from our heart, not from our mouth. Uh, we begin with reading the Bible uh, and believing that God will speak to us, reading the Gospels, especially uh, reading a chapter of the Gospel. And before we read, asking that God will speak to us in, in what we read. Uh, and if we read in a prayerful manner, we will discover that God often speaks to us, uh, always speaks to us when we read the Bible. Um, and we try to be of service. Uh, we ask God, even when we have little faith in him, we ask that he show us opportunities to be of service in love and kindness to others. Uh, and in that way, we discover that God becomes present in our lives. Uh, so even when we do not have a close relationship with God, we must do those things, those behaviors from the heart, not just from the mouth and the head, but from the heart that will uh, open up a way for us to experience and encounter Christ. Um, so may the Lord bless you if that's what you are doing. If you are a church member who finds that they are separated from God, distant from God, then it is the same. We have to begin doing from the heart those things that will bring us into contact with God. Uh, if we are a church member, we must receive communion. Uh, even if we have doubts, we must pray as, as the poorest in the New Testament, in the Gospels, prayed. Uh, help me. Forgive me. Um, I can hardly believe, but I pray that you will reach out in your compassion and mercy uh, and and speak to me and show yourself to me uh, God shows himself to the one who seeks him uh, but often when we are seeking God we have to change things we have to change our thinking as I've said we have to change our behavior so someone who is very happy to be uh, in habitual sin will find it hard to experience God because our Lord Jesus himself says the pure in heart will see God so if we are comfortable in our sin, we will find it very hard to encounter God. If we are dealing with our sinfulness with repentance, uh, with contrition, uh, with sorrow, uh, as the publican did, Lord, I am not worthy even to lift my eyes towards heaven, but I pray have mercy upon me. Uh, then we can encounter God, even if we find ourselves to be very sinful. But when we are comfortable with sin, uh, when we allow wrong thoughts to uh, have a habitual place within within our mind, within our heart, then we will struggle to find God. We have to do some things to show to ourselves that we are serious about encountering God. God, who is always present, waits for us to show that we are really serious. Uh, and when we make some effort, he will always be there and we will discover fruitfulness in him and with him. But when we are unwilling to make any effort, then it is our own uh, imperfections. It is our own unwillingness to set out on that journey which uh, prevents us encountering God. Uh, the, parable, the parable of the prodigal son shows us a man who had everything and was deeply unhappy uh, and, and he lost it all and discovered that it was of a very temporary character and he felt miserable, hungry and dirty sitting in the pigsty. Uh, none of that was repentance and many of us uh, are feeling uh, Shame, ashamed, guilty, embarrassed, um, disappointed in ourselves. We have a low self-esteem uh, because of uh, the way we allow ourselves to sin. But none of those feelings are repentance. Repentance is metanoia, which means change, to change our way of thinking. Uh, and so for the prodigal son, he really repented when he stood up and made the first step back home to the father. And this is required of all of us, whether we are inside the church or outside the church. If we feel ourselves distant from our Heavenly Father, we must stand up and take whatever those first steps are uh, on the journey back towards him. Uh, it, it is not compulsory to pray all the Agbeya hours. 
uh, if you are in a situation where you can speak with your spiritual father uh, or the priest, one of the priests of your church, then they should be able to help you to construct a rule which is suitable for your uh, situation in life <coughs> and also for your uh, measure of maturity in the Christian faith. Um, usually, sorry, I'm losing my voice for talking too talking too much usually it is necessary for us to pray in the morning and evening uh, so that we establish a place at the beginning and end of the day where we definitely and committedly encounter God uh, I would rather suggest that through the day as much as possible we should pray the Jesus prayer in one way or another Lord Jesus Christ son of God have mercy on us Lord Jesus Christ son of God have mercy on me a sinner uh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us all. Uh, we can change the words. We can pray for the people we are working for. Um, if we are in a medical situation and meeting many patients, we can pray before we meet each one. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on this person. Uh, and when they leave us, we can pray, Lord Jesus Christ, bless this person. Uh, the important thing is that throughout the day, in increasing measure, we are in contact with God so that God becomes present in every moment of every hour of every day. Uh, and, and this becomes uh, uh, habitual to us. Uh, praying the Jesus prayer, we can also use the form from our Coptic Tazbeha. My Lord Jesus Christ, help me. We can pray that. Um, when we remember, when we discover that we are no longer praying, we are no longer thinking of God. Then we begin praying again. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Uh, and, and I suggest to young people in my care that they should pray five times. Five times is long enough to have to think about it. Five times is enough not to just be able to do it as a habit and then forget God again. Uh, and to pray it five times is to have the possibility of beginning to pray it much more. Every time we understand and see that we have stopped praying, we should start praying again. And in such a way, slowly over time, by, by repeated practice, we will discover that we are praying more and more and uh, even praying continually, which is the purpose of our life, that every moment is lived in the presence of God and with God. Uh, unceasing prayer is, is not a practice for uh, an elite in the monasteries. It is what the Christian life looks like. And we have different circumstances to monastics. We have to fit it into our life in a different way. Uh, but to live every moment in the presence of God is what it means to be a Christian. Uh, and when we pray in such a way as God gives us strength and grace and maturity, uh, then we discover that in every situation, God is present. Uh, in every temptation, God is present. Uh, in every trial and difficulty, God is present. Uh, so, so pray in the morning and evening from the Agbeya. Uh, if you want to pray the midday prayer, if you have time over your lunch break, it's, it's relatively short. Uh, just pray one or two psalms. I usually advise people. Um, it's possible to go and have your packed lunch or something uh, and pray the midday prayers. But to try and discover unceasing prayer is, is the goal of our orthodox spirituality in, in terms of prayerfulness. Uh, and also that the prayer we do offer is filled with warmth of heart and attention. Uh, it is better to pray a little, but with much warmth of heart and attention, than to pray many words, but distractedly, uh, and as if we are just speaking to the ceiling or, or to the sky. So even if we only pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy, to do that with warmth of heart and with attention is very powerful and brings about a fruitfulness uh, even immediately. Uh, so, so let me recommend that. Uh, how many psalms should I pray at each hour? Uh, I, again, I recommend um, it, it's good to memorize one psalm from from either the from the morning and evening, so that when you can pray, you have already many of the prayers and psalms in in your in your heart and mind. Uh, if you have time to pray two psalms, that's good. Uh, but it is better to pray with warmth and attention than to try and pray all of the words. Uh, I say to some people, 
Uh, it is better to pray one of the hours through the day. So if you miss the morning hour, you still have the mid morning. You still have the lunchtime. You still have the mid afternoon, the evening and then the night prayers. It is better if you are uh, in complicated situations to be sure you pray one hour with attention and warmth of heart than to imagine that you can pray all seven every day. Um, most mothers of young children cannot easily give that attention. Most people working in an office or in a medical situation cannot easily give that attention. But we can easily pray often, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. My Lord Jesus Christ, help me. And if we begin to do that every time we do anything, if we're in university or college, every time we start a class, it would be easy to make the sign of the cross quietly on our forehead and pray, my Lord Jesus Christ, help me. In such a way, we increase our experience and sense of God being present with us. Um, do I know of any pre-Chalcedonian saints who have explicitly taught me a physicism other than St. Cyril? Um, yes, certainly, certainly. But we have to understand what we mean by mere fitism, physicism. Uh, we do not mean ever that the humanity and the divinity of Christ are mixed in any way. They are entirely different. Um, but we do not separate the humanity and the divinity of Christ so that we say there are these two. We do not fall into the error of saying there is a man called Jesus and God lives in him. Uh, and so if we understand that mere physicism stands for the idea that there is one who is Jesus Christ, and there is one who is the word and they are the same so that anyone who touched Jesus Christ is touching the word of God in his humanity. Uh, the one who died on the cross is the word of God. This is where we find the oneness. Uh, this is where we insist on one being, one identity. That is what mere physicism means. Uh, one identity in which there is a duality of humanity and divinity, which are entirely different but they are never separated in Christ. They both belong to him and are both experienced by him as his own. Uh, and so when we understand that we are talking about one identity of God, the word who has become man as Jesus Christ, uh, then we understand that many of the early fathers, all of the early fathers speak in this way, because this is orthodoxy. We can read the Cappadocian fathers. We can read even earlier into Irenaeus. Uh, we can read almost any of the fathers and we understand that the orthodox understanding of Christ is that he is one Lord Jesus Christ. He is the word of God incarnate and no other person or being. And that's where the mere aspect comes from. Not trying to say that divinity and humanity uh, have, have become one thing uh, because the divinity is not a thing at all. Uh, it is beyond our comprehension. But we can say and we do insist as the Orthodox faith that this person, Jesus Christ, is the same person as God, the word. He doesn't represent him. He doesn't have God, the word living in him. He is the same person, uh, human and divine, which are distinct and they retain their own integrity so that he is not changed in becoming man. And his manhood is not changed in becoming his own manhood of God, the word. They remain what they are, but he is one. And to touch Christ is to touch God. Uh, that is what we believe and confess. Uh, and all of the early fathers teach this. And so much of the controversy around Chalcedon uh, is to a great extent people talking past each other. And this was very well understood in the early period, where both sides understood that the others had essentially the same faith, but no one knew what to do about the Council of Chalcedon. Uh, it's uh, the end of uh, the presentation now. Thank you for bearing with me. And I hope that uh, a few of the things I have said uh, might be help helpful to a few of you. May God bless you all. The love of God, the Father, the grace of his only begotten sin, Jesus Christ, and the communion and gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all and remain with you all evermore. Amen.